Welcome, I'm your host Lee Adams and today we're going to talk about something everybody loves and that's music. I mean we all have different tastes but we all love music. Uh, joining us today is an author of a very interesting book. It's called Behind the Stage Door, A Promoter's Life Behind the Scenes. He just released this outstanding memoir of working with some of the biggest artists in the country and in other countries. Please let me introduce the longtime promoter of the, the, the Caesar Angler Productions, Mr. Rich Angler. Rich, it's great to have you here today. Well, thank you so much. Thanks it's, for having me on your show. It's really great. What a great book. What a great book. So we, we want to start a little bit back when you were younger. So when you were in high school and you were in college, uh, where did you, What's your music background? Well, my music background was uh, I was professionally trained with as a trumpet player. And uh, as things evolved, uh, one of my classmates when I was in 11th grade came to me and he said, hey, we're going to start a combo. I'm looking for a drummer. I said, well, I play trumpet. Can I get in there? He goes, Ugh, that's a corny instrument right now. He goes, uh, I need a drummer. I said, well, I can play drums too. I didn't really play drums, but I had, I had a pair of uh, drumsticks and I had a cymbal that I got from the music room. And I said, uh, can I, I, I can play, I, just give me a chance. He goes, well, we're, we're playing for a wedding coming up in two weeks. He said, we're rehearsing this Saturday, can you make it? I said, I sure can. So I remembered my dad, who was a glass worker in, in, uh, in Creighton at PPG, uh, had a buddy who had a pair of bongo drums and a conga drum. I thought, hey, maybe I could do a makeshift drum kit and put this thing together and show up. So I show up with this thing at, at practice, and the guy, they go, what is this bunch of crap? This, how can you possibly make this thing work? I said, this is, a, I put, <laughs> put a little fake on here. I said, hey, you guys have not been reading a lot. This, is, this stuff is really starting to happen with this kind of a setup. <laughs> they go, all right, let's try it. So sure enough, they said, you know what, it worked. I had no bass drum or anything, but we go uh, two weeks later or, and play this gig in, uh, up in, uh, in Trenum, Pennsylvania for a wedding, and nobody threw anything at us, and I actually made $25. And my parents, I come back home, and people, my parents go, they actually paid you? Twenty-five dollars. What year was this? This about? was in uh, 1963. Wow. And uh, the uh, minimum wage was like I think a dollar an hour, maybe even less at that time. And they said, uh, "I can't believe you made twenty-five dollars." I said, "Yes, but I could make more if you would lend me seventy-five dollars. We'll get m more engagements, and we could go. I could pay you back quickly." So they go, "All right, let's do that." So I go over to a, a music store and I buy a real set of drums for a hundred dollars because I had my twenty-five and their seventy-five. It was perfect. So we could have another rehearsal and I asked the leader. I said, "Well, when's our next engagement?" He goes, "We have no, no more engagements." I said, "Well, why?" I said, "I I just borrowed money from my parents. I need to make money." I said, "Can I be the leader?" I said, "I I want to lead the band. I'll get us engagements." So I start calling places, uh, after hours, clubs, clubs in uh, fire halls, anywhere, anywhere that we could get engagements. Next thing I know, boom, 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 boom. We're playing Friday, Saturday, Sundays on every weekend, and the band started to really grow, and I started to make some money. About that, you know, can I be the leader? You know, it's, it's, it's a funny story. You know, I, I, one of my best friends in high school was a trumpet player, and I used to be the roadie for his wedding band. But I think if they had you as a promoter, they might have got more work. But, <laughs> so you really went and got some work, and, and that's how things started. Now, how do you learn the drums, though? You just learn it on your own? Well, I did. I, I fortunately had some, I had musical talent because of the playing the trumpet and everything, so I knew, knew, uh, beats in 4-4 four, four time and 3-4 time and all these things. So I was able to, I picked it up quickly and, well, because I had to, because it, this, this was something I go, if I could make money at something that I enjoy like this, this would be outrageous. Then, what comes after 63? 1964, and my life changed. All of a sudden, we had this combo. The Beatles, February 9th, 1964, come to the Ed Sullivan show and I go, Oh no, we're going to have to change our whole business plan here. So I go, guys, start growing your hair. We're going to change our music. <laughs> Instead of playing polkas and, and, and uh, surfing music, 
now we're going to try to play some of this British music, and, wow. and none of us could sing worth, worth anything, so we did a lot of instrumentals of I Want to Hold Your Hand and all these, all these Beatles songs, and the Rolling Stones then came out, Dave Clark Five, and so our band started to evolve and started to, uh, to, to make bigger money, and I started changing some personnel around and got some better players, and, and uh, we changed the name a couple times, and then I ended up with the Grains of Sand, and uh, that's the band that really started to really catch fire. So you, you, took, you just took control of this group and you just launched it on an upward uh, ascent. Now, the Beatles, you think about the Beatles, what an impact they had in this country. You know, just the hair, we were wearing longer hair back in the day and the music that it influenced, it just had such a, and, and we didn't have the technology and everything that we have today back then, but what an unbelievable impact they had. Oh, but, by all means, it was it was, uh, and still today, their their uh, their music is timeless, and the singing quality and the quality of the music is was was uh, second to none. And uh, so, what what happened uh, to continue the story? My band started to get very famous, and uh, people would call me and say, "Rich, I want to I want to book your band for my college or my my church event or whatever special event." I go, "Well, my band is booked." Friday, Saturday night, but we can get Lee Adams and the Rockers. And I'd call you up and I'd say, Lee, I got you $500 for uh, this Saturday night. Will you pay me 10% of that money? And you go, oh, anytime you call me. So the next thing you know, I have, I have 20 or 30 Lee Adams bands under my wings paying me all this commission. Then I get a call one day from the music union. They go, hey, what are you doing? I said, what do you mean? They said, you're booking all these bands. I said, yeah, these are my friends. They go, no, no, no. You have a business there. Either you stop booking them or you have to get a license, theatrical employment license. So that was in uh, uh, several years later. And uh, I bought my, uh, got my license. And that's one of the, that, that same week is when I met my girlfriend, Cindy. Uh, that's still my wife to, the, to this day. How many years? And uh, oh, uh, over forty. Okay. Yes. Yeah, okay. So, I, and I also started my first company on Walnut Street that same that same week. So it was monumental, and that was 1969. Wow. How so somebody, if somebody out there in TV land could do the math, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Now, so you, you just kind of, so where did you get this kind of enterprising um, attitude and way of life? I mean, you just take over, let me be the leader, and then all of a sudden you start thinking, okay, I can't, I cannot hand, I can't bring my band to you, but I'll find somebody else. I mean, where did, where did this come from, Rich? Well, that's kind of, my book touches on a lot of this. I think it's going to be inspirational for young kids to follow a dream, and if you want something bad enough, no matter what it is, as long as you do a great job at it and have the burning desire to succeed. And a lot of people don't understand what that means. That means you have to have it right here, that nothing is going to stop you. And uh, that's, that's what I had, but to answer your question, I have no idea. I have no, not to on my knowledge, there's any background of anybody in business or negotiating skills in my family or my mother's family. Uh, and uh, it was a God-given gift, I guess, that I was able to develop. Interesting. So now you, you have this, this kind of promotion company, so to speak, along with the band. So you're playing in your band and you're promoting a lot of local artists. When did you take this to the next step? Well, uh, that went on until about 1971, where I was approached by two guys from Greensburg that wanted to start doing some shows. Uh, a little bit before that, I started uh, sending out uh, brochures to the colleges, uh, like Santana was a new act, Big Brother and the Holding Company, uh, uh, Creedence Clearwater, all these acts were started, the Kinks and Ten years after, all these bands from England were starting to emerge. So I sent a flyer out, and uh, a, a person from St. Bonaventure University was my first big break. He called me and said, hey, can you book uh, Johnny Winter up here for us, the guitar player? And I said, absolutely. I said, that's on my list, right? And he goes, oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's done. 
So instead of making hundreds of dollars, now I started to make thousands of dollars. So Johnny Winder was like $5,000. And with my production and being there and producing the show, I was probably able to make $1,000 that night for that show. So I thought, boy, this is a grand opportunity. Rather than book those local bands, which I still continue to do, there was another uh, larger upper scale level of, of these national acts. So with that, I got this call from these guys from Greensburg, and they wanted to start, start to do bigger shows. Down at the Stanley Theater was sitting there, the Syria Moss, uh, uh, Kennedy Hall out at the uh, St. Vincent College and some of these other places. Johnstown War Memorial. I started booking 10 years after. Uh, uh, Lou Reed, King Crimson, uh, Genesis as an opening act. Nobody even knew who Genesis was at that time. And um, I started honing my skills as a promoter, helping these guys promote these shows. So uh, with that, in about 1973, another, another uh, phone call took place. I get Pat the Caesar calling me, who was at that time promoting at the Civic Arena and at the Syria Mosque. Uh, he, he said, hey, why don't we form a company, call it the Caesar Angler? We shook, and the Caesar Angler was born late 73. And in 1974, we had our first first big show. How about that? So you started with Johnny Winter, and uh, what kind of venues did you play outside of the Syria Mosque and the Stanley? What what venues did you do? I I think you talked about La Trobe one point when we talked earlier. Yeah, John's, Johnstown War Memorial. We did a few shows out there. We did a, a couple shows in McKee's Rocks, a Blue Oyster Cult show. It was above a Roth rug. Uh, company out there and there was a big ballroom upstairs uh, just about anywhere that we could do a couple po point point park college at the time we did a couple uh, events down there for so them. Johnny Winter was one who was your next bigger act that people might know well when the Caesar Wrangler was formed uh, can we go from there that my first big show there was Fleetwood Mac which was uh, it was extremely successful financially, but uh, there was a bit of a snafu. Whenever I was there at the show, uh, the group Spirit played first, and then I had Fleetwood Mac. Wasn't, they were almost ready to go on stage, but they didn't arrive at the facility yet, and there was a reason. They had to go on in about 10 minutes, so I see these people coming through the door, and then this, this uh, uh, manager uh, guy, he said, hey, I'm um, uh, Clifford Davis, and I'm the manager of Fleetwood Mac. I said, well, where's Fleetwood Mac? I know Fleetwood Mac because I, I just played them recently at Carnegie uh, Hall in Oakland there, right down the road. And I said, I know Mick Fleetwood. I know Christy McVie. I knew John McVie. Where are they? He goes, they just walked by you. That's the band that, as it is today. That's Fleetwood Mac. I own the name. He owns the name. I go, well, that doesn't mean anything. These pe people out here in the audience are waiting to see the real Fleetwood Mac. He goes, this is the real Fleetwood Mac. There's, the other one doesn't exist anymore. I didn't know. They were in England, and they were in a bitter battle over the name. So next thing I know, I said, I'm not letting your act go on stage. He goes, oh, yes, you are. Next thing I know, I see a punch coming like this. I duck in. I, we, we're tussling back at the backstage. <laughs> security comes, breaks us up. Next thing I know, this guy runs on stage and says, ladies and gentlemen, Fleetwood Mac, and then, boom, that bogus band goes on stage and plays. Then I'm going, what am I going to do? They end the song. It was Rattlesnake Shake. I'll never forget it. The first song, the crowd goes crazy, loving it. And I go, I don't know what's going on. I don't know. You know, because there, there was no MTV. There, was no, there wasn't much TV coverage back then. So of it was these more acts. just the music. The music. And the music was great, these ba this band was doing, but the faces weren't matching the Jeez. music. So the next, next day, I called the agent. I go, hey, I, we were all snookered here. You got you to gotta call all the other promoters across the country and tell them to cancel their show. This is a bogus act. So we got them off the road. Then a year later, I was able to get the real Fleetwood Mac back, and they were very remorseful, and they go, hey, it was a bitter battle, but we got our name back. Well, you know, I, I, from what, what I read, the Syria Mosque, I guess, was one of the main venues prior to the arena in, in, in Pittsburgh. It was one of the, I mean, I, I, I went to many concerts down there, Barb and Turner Overdrive, a few other ones, 
but is that so is that one of the mainstays that you used prior it, to the arena it was it was a real sweetheart place it was 300 or 3500 seats and it was intimate that the uh, seats came all the way right kind of around to the side great facility and the Stanley Theater was down there. It was a dying movie house at the time, and I'll go get into that, how, how we ended up buying, buying the facility. Uh, and I'd do some shows at the Stanley, but the Syria Moss was kind of like the place to go at the time. But no air conditioning. No air conditioning, right. And so it, we were very limited in the summer down there. We, <laughs> we'd, we'd really stretch it. We'd go into uh, April and uh, maybe catch a little bit of May, and then that, that was just yeah. about it. Yeah. And then we had some great shows. Bruce's uh, uh, famous debut, basically, he played at a small club earlier, but his basic debut was at the Syria Mosque. Uh, a few weeks later, he was on the cover of Time and Newsweek, and boom, born to run, and history was made. Second time in, uh, he, came, he went back to the Syria Mosque, blew the, blew the fans away again, played, played three hours, and encore after encore, and he ended the show, went in his dressing room, people cheering, 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 show's over, they start following out. Everybody starts following out of the building, leaving security, you know, signed out, security left. Ten minutes later, Bruce goes, in his mind, I'm going back, he's going back on. He runs back out on stage, starts playing again. People already in their cars, some halfway down the steps outside and the sidewalks, people go, he's back on. They throw their cars in park and, and turn around, whip around, people jumping on stage, no security. It was bedlam. It's, Bruce was loving it. So going on, going on, going on. I was in the box office still doing a, a we call it a settlement. You got to do, do the math and figure out how much uh, the, the, all the expenses were that night and, and Bruce's pay and my, our pay and whatever. So somehow, Miss Steele, she was the, the, the manager, uh, a, a real tough lady. To, 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 she ran a tight ship up there and she could, wanted to catch her last bus wherever she lived and she was beyond angry. She looked for me for probably two seconds and figured out she couldn't find me. Headed back, knocked in, well, the, no security on the stage door now because that guy's gone, goes into the backstage, gets on stage and they're looking for a chord. She, you know, she's old fashioned. While, she while thought, Bruce is playing. While Bruce is playing, she thinks that she can pull one chord and kill everything. <laughs> <laughs> so modern electronics and, and electricity, even back in the 70s, didn't allow that. So, so she's looking around, so she figures, mm, I'm going to go, I'm going out on stage. So she goes on stage, Bruce is playing like this, he's going like this. Next thing Bruce knows, she's in his face like this. Young man, young man, <laughs> this must end. <laughs> and Bruce goes, uh, like, uh, like, uh, dumbfounded, and he goes, uh, and he knew this was pretty serious. So I guess he had, he signals the band ends the song and it goes running back into the dressing room, and uh, it was it was priceless. It was something like out of an old 1950s rock and roll black and white flick of where where the the where uh, the establishment Let's didn't want it. to see any rock and roll. Stop that, <laughs> young <laughs> man. Stop that. And speaking of that, speaking of Bruce, and my wife's a huge Bruce fan, we have something with Bruce right here. Yes, yes, indeed. This is uh, very special. Um, opened PNC Park August 6, 2003, uh, with Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band, all the guys. And uh, Bruce, kind enough to uh, autograph it. For, for me, and uh, but that that is special. But this is extremely rare and special. It's a handwritten set list by Bruce. Bruce, every one of his shows, sits down a few hours before the show and handwrites the set list for his band. And then the band gets the list, and they they have to follow it up. Uh, started that night with uh, Promised Land, and the fir the show ended right here. Uh, after the 16th no song, surrender. Yeah, no surrender, and he comes uh, up playing five more tunes on the first encore. first first encore, and he always writes B2R, Born to Run. So he ends uh, he ended the first encore, and then he came on with the second 
encore. I d couldn't figure out that song uh, on his with his writing there, but uh, Jungle Land for sure, and then he ended the second encore and came on with Rosalita and Dancing in the Street. Oh my goodness gracious, that's yeah. incredible. Yeah, good stuff. That's great stuff. <laughs> we have some other things up here on the set. Why don't you talk about this particular record right in front of you here? Well, this platinum record, it's from uh, ACDC. It's multiple platinum. I think at that time they sold uh, two to four million copies of that. And uh, I have uh, 14 platinum and gold records that uh, acts have given given me over the years of, for helping and uh, uh, helping their careers and one uh, producing their shows in several markets and, and uh, doing right by them. And now and, we have another one over here. We have another platinum. Is this a platinum record? Yes, it is. It's a multi-platinum from uh, Kansas Left Overture and um, very dear to my heart. They, uh, they credit me for really launching their career nationally. And it was launched out of Pittsburgh. Uh, little did they know or little did I know that that was going to happen. But uh, uh, Pittsburgh is their second home. And, well, well, they just played the 40th anniversary here. That's they? it. Did they, you do that? Yeah, I did. I was very touched. I, I got a call uh, one afternoon uh, last winter and they said, uh, Rich, we uh, do you know it's our 40th anniversary? I go, well, I thought it was right around this time, and I figured in my mind they're going to invite me to go to Vegas or New York or somewhere they're going to do a big show. He goes, well, we want to do this big show with you. you. You made our life. You made our career. We want to pay you back and the fans from Pittsburgh. We want to come in and do a very special show. And I'm just like, I was very emotional. It's, it was just so touching that, that, they, that these guys remembered where it all started wow. and uh, so I put a 40-piece symphony orchestra with them for the first half of the wow. show and then they rocked out with the touring band and brought, brought the old members back Terry Livgren and Robbie Steinhardt was planned to be there and Dave Hope Robbie had a unfortunate uh, incident he had a uh, stroke and had to have uh, bypass surgery and couldn't make it but he's doing well and uh, fabulous fabulous guys. Now this guitar right in front of me right here this is the what the rolling stones that's yes that's uh that's priceless that is a uh, uh signed by uh, keith richard and ronnie wood from the rolling stones uh, it was signed uh, at the civic arena that very one i have a couple others this uh also was the third time in uh in in recent recent years we had had the Stones two times more in uh, in the 80s in the uh, Three River Stadium, which was uh, phenomenal. The Steel Wheels tour and the uh, Voodoo Lounge tour. So a couple of Voodoo Lounge pass, passes were on that, that one also. And next to that is another really pretty famous guitar, wouldn't we say? The, very special. It uh, was one of the greatest one of the greatest moments in my music life. Uh, to be uh, face with face with uh, uh, a real, real icon of Bob Dylan. Uh, Bob uh, produced many shows and promoted many shows with him, but this very one at the Icy Light Amphitheater in Pittsburgh down at Station Square on the river down there, uh, Bob, uh, uh, we were backstage talking and Bob was, uh, it, was, it was just a magical moment because I'm sitting here talking with him and I, I, I just could not help remembering back whenever it was a dollar an hour and I was in my grade school and got a summer job and I was able to sweep the floors in that in that grade school and just like a Rolling Stone came on uh, KDKA AM and uh, Clark Ray show and that song played for five minutes or six minutes and you could never get a song ever played for more than two and a half three minutes and I'm just like, what is this? This is fantastic. It's nothing I've ever heard before. And here I am face to face with, with Bob Dylan. And he was kind enough to uh, sign the guitar. And what a, what a great moment for me. And I can, I, it's hard to even imagine. You know? So, you know, and that's one of my questions. So you were pretty starstruck at that moment, which I think anybody would be. Were there any other moments that you could recall going back in the day that you were starstruck because you certainly were with some big time musical artists. Well, 
aside from well, that story on, for Bob from Bob is in is in the book, and a, another one that's uh, 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 very interesting is Sir Paul McCartney. Uh, we were the first time around. It was called uh, Wings Over America, and uh, couldn't play Pittsburgh because the Civic Arena Civic Arena's roof wasn't strong enough. The ceiling infrastructure, the steel, to hold the McCartney show. Wow. So over the years, Celine Dion show finally brought the ceiling down, and and it didn't collapse, but it, it had to be canceled because it was too heavy for the roof. So structural engineers came in, fixed the roof, put new support beams, so now it could handle big shows. So in 1980, I had the opportunity to, to uh, negotiate a great deal with uh, Paul McCartney for two nights. And uh, I was thrilled. First night uh, on soundcheck, Paul goes to the piano by himself. He sits down, so nobody in the building. And he starts doing a little sound check. And I, I kind of meandered around to the side and just kind of was leaning on the corner of the stage. And he goes, starts with uh, Let It Be and sings a few bars and the hair on the back of my neck is like, oh my God, I can't, this is, this is, am I, am I really hearing this and this is going to be here for two days, this is the greatest. And then he goes into Let It Be and a couple other songs and it was just like phenomenal. So he goes backstage and back to his dressing room. A few minutes later I walk around in a corridor backstage, his uh, road manager and uh, production manager come to me and he goes, I'm not sure if Paul's going to be able to play tonight. And that's exactly what I did. I go, what? I said, I just heard like one of the greatest things I ever heard. They go, well, great to you, but Paul is having some problems with his, with his throat and uh, we need you to get three doctors here right away. We need a holistic doctor, ear, eye, nose, and throat doctor, and a, a general practitioner. Just I said, like that. You got it. I said, well, we already had a general practitioner there. So I said, all right, we have one here already. I'll make some calls. I knew it. A person from Sewickley that was uh, holistic and boom, 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 boom. Next thing I know, for, for for tickets to see Paul McCartney, you'll be surprised what people will drop and won't leave a dinner and come <laughs> come out. And and uh, yeah. that, we had all three of them there, and I I went into pray mode. They just <laughs> they went in to see Paul, and in the interim, I'm calling the, up upstairs from the back backstage uh, uh, office to management of the Civic Arena. What days can he come back? Two days next month or the next month after, if he's if he has to cancel. Now you have to remember, all the people have left their homes already. Babysitters are being paid or having dinners, and they're they're going to be. And this is walk not through your mind. Yeah, they're going to be walking into this building yeah. in about one hour and fifteen, one hour and twenty minutes. Oh boy! So whatever had to happen had to happen fast. So about forty-five minutes later. The road manager comes back, he goes, well, it's your lucky day. He's going to play. I said, will he play both days? They go, we can't tell you that. He'll play. He's going to play tonight. Hopefully he makes it through the whole show, and, and hopefully it's, it's going to be great. So I said, well, that's great. I'm, uh, let's, hopefully hopefully it'll, be, it'll, be, it'll be right. So he, he went on stage. I were able to talk to him before four times. He signed a, a bunch of things for me, and it was uh, it was it was very special. His uh, daughter was there; she was shooting some video. You know, she went on to uh, 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 to be to be a very 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 big designer in, in clothing. And uh, his son James was there; was very much into Nintendo and all those little games. We talked about all that, and I asked him how he's feeling. He said, "Hey, I think I'm going to be fine." So. He went on and just blew people away. And I, that's one of the few shows I actually sat in the audience, which most of the shows I would never be able to see. I'd see the first 10 minutes and maybe something in the middle and maybe a few songs at the end if we got finished with the settlement. But uh, that one, I was, I was dead set on sitting in my seat with my wife and we, were, we enjoyed it. And I, that night I was one of the biggest fans. So, I mean, you know, and I have thought of that. I've thought about these these bands and these artists that tour across the country. They're doing date after date after date, and their throat is part of their voice, and they have to sing and they have to keep that up. So, I would assume that might not be the only time you ran into that type of issue. You know, with with people having trouble going on for whatever reason. Oh yeah, 
that, that, that happens uh, a lot, and a lot of them stall because they want, if it's an outdoor show, they want it to be dark. They want it to be really dark so the lights make it, make it better, or they're, they've had maybe too much to drink or too many, uh, too many whatevers, and, and uh, they, they, they can melt, melt in their seat a little bit, and it's hard to get them on stage. But there's something about once you finally get them up and get them on stage, there's a, some sort of adrenaline that kicks in that uh, the thrill of being on stage in front of all those people, it just kind of kicks into these, and they go into muscle memory or, or, uh, or uh, like overdrive and, and put up. Well, that, may, that, that reminds me of a story of my own. I, I went to IUP and I got on the concert committee and I did one and only concert and it was the Jay Giles Band and I'm, I'm, I'm eating cafeteria food at the time, which wasn't like high grade food. <laughs> so I walk in the backstage and I look in and there's Jay Giles, Peter Wolf and Jay Giles, and they have a big spread and I, I, I couldn't not take my eyes off it. So I'm looking at all this food that I haven't seen food like that. And one of them said, hey, you want to come on in and get something? And I thought, sure. Well, I guess the concert head, he wasn't too happy about that, but they invited me in. But the thing that I remember the most was Jay Giles right before he went on stage. I mean, he looked to be in no condition to be playing that night. I was just shocked. I was, look, <laughs> I was transfixed on him and he, he was kind of swaying and he was out of it. But when he went on stage, he just turned a switch and he was fine. So any memorable people like that that you recall that were in not the greatest of shapes but went on and did well? Yeah, back in 1975, which was our first for De Caesar Angler, big deal that I negotiated uh, with, with uh, uh, it was big money back then. I think uh, Eric Clapton was six figures and... It was it was serious serious stuff and the the band the band with Garth Garth Hudson and you know, that the whole gang and several other acts Three Rivers Stadium July fifth and uh, Eric I I go back to see Eric and he's looks like he was feeling no pain molded into the couch Yvonne Elman sitting next to him she just came off a of Broadway of Jesus Christ Superstar playing a Mary Magdalene, and uh, we're, he, we're, we're doing some small talk, and he's telling me it's his birthday, and I tell him, okay, will you, uh, do you want us to have a birthday party for you afterwards? He goes, yeah, yeah man, I think uh, it'll be good. I go, well, if we have it, where are you going to come? He goes, yeah, might. I, I, I believe we'll, I'll, be a, I'll come. Yeah, put it, put it together. Will I get a cake? And I said, sure, okay, we'll get you a cake. So uh, we, uh, we're going on, and now I can hear the crowd out there, Eric, Eric, Eric. And I go, what do you think? Can we have a show? He goes, oh, pretty soon. I go, no, 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 we got to do it now. I said, we, because first of all, everything unionized, and, and the clock is running, everybody's getting paid, all those people out there. So I said, come on, man. So we, I got a couple of his roadies. We got them up, got them going down the hall. <laughs> We get to the steps, work, got to get him up the steps. He finally, we got him all the way up the steps. They put the guitar on him. Ladies and gentlemen, Eric Clapton, boom. He hit the stage, beautiful. I, I didn't watch any of that show. I was just so nervous that he would get through the show. But it, he was, he, apparently it was great. They got great reviews. Uh, couldn't have asked for anything better. So show ended. The the uh, party was planned. I, we rented a little place out right outside of the Liberty Tubes, a uh, little little divey place because we didn't want anybody anybody to be there. And uh, the cake was there. My wife was there. Some of the agents, some of the band members came. Some of the Clapton's members, but no Eric Clapton. So the party's going on. Everybody's having a good time. We're sitting in a chair. I'm sitting right near the cake. In fact. Somehow, I found a picture of, of, uh, of uh, Clapton's agent and the band's agent and myself sitting near the cake. And you, you can actually see a corner of the cake in, in, the, the, book. Pic, in, in the, the book. In the book, exactly. And um, all of a sudden, the party's getting winding down. Some people are already starting to leave the door. Boom! 
spray it, busts open. Next thing I see, it's Clapton. He's there. He's walking in. He's looking. I walk up. I say, hey, Eric, happy birthday again. I said, glad you're here. He goes, where's me blanking cake? And I go, oh, your cake. You're right over here. So he, he walks over and he looks at the cake, shakes his head, reaches down, picks up the cake like this. He goes, looking at it, turns around, starts walking out the door. Right before he gets the door, he turns around and goes, toodaloo. <laughs> and the door slams and he's gone. He took the cake. I, I tell everybody, party's over. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's done. Cake's gone. Oh, my gosh. I guess some people were waiting around for cake, too. Uh, I, I think he likes cake, Eric. <laughs> well, now, that's a new thing to think about when you see him now. But So how about stage fright? I mean, I, I, I know that, you know, I know some young artists, and they, they suffer from that. So I'm, I'm guessing that you ran into a little bit of that. Why don't you tell a story or two about that? <laughs> More than a little bit of that. Oh, really? A lot of that. Yes, uh, very, very great artist, Carly Simon. Uh, loved all of her songs and, and a terrific talent. Two nights at the Stanley Theater. She saw, well, first of all, it was one show. Uh, uh, no, not two nights. Take that back. Two shows in one night. Mm. And so we sold out the 7 o'clock show. Boom, like that. So called the agent. Hey, can we add another one? Sure, add another one. We'll go with a 1030 show. Good, great. So... The Stanley held 3,500 people. So show day comes, 3,500 people in there. First act plays, everything's good. Pete Hewlett, uh, an act that I used to manage, Pete was the Peters and the, Peter and the Pipers, and then he went on to be the background singer for Billy Joel, now is the background singer at this time for Carly Simon. Pete and I were conversing before her show, and he goes, hey, Rich, there's a chance she might not even play tonight. I said, he said that, She's having some, some uh, problems playing in front of these different audiences. And I go, really? I said, I, I can't. I, yeah, it's some kind of, some kind of uh, fear or something. I said, well, hopefully you guys can get through it. So he goes back. Show starts. Show was, show was decent. Um, all of a sudden, next thing we know, she's starting to have the lights dimming down on stage. And now she's inviting people on stage. She has about... 20, 30 people in front of her sitting around, almost like a campfire uh, uh, party or a concert. And uh, some people were coming and they said, we can't hardly hear, we can't hear her. And some of them from the back, 3,500 seats back up on top, they said, we can hardly see her. They, somebody dimmed the lights down. I said, well, that's what she wants. She wants this atmosphere and all a uh, nice, nice feeling and wants that fuzzy kind of feeling. So she gets through the first show. And um, so all 3,500 people have to get up and leave. We have to wait until the last person leaves, and then we can open the door. Now, there's 3,500 more people all the way down Penn Avenue, as far as you can see, probably to the convention center at this point, waiting to come in. One big, long line. So sure enough, Pete comes back. He goes, I think, you're, I think you have some problems. I don't think she's going to play. So I said, well... Next thing I know, Lucy Simons, Carly's sister, was the road manager and tour manager at the time. So, so Lucy comes to me. She goes, Rich, she goes, uh, Carly, Carly can't play the next, the, the next show. I said, I said, please. I said, it's 65 minutes. She surely can get through to 60, 65 minutes. I got 3,500 people. What, we have, what are we going to do with all these people? She goes, she's not going to play. I said, can I talk to her? She said, of course, if, if you want to, do your best. I said, all right, I'm running. So I bolt back to the dressing room. I get, I get back there. I knock on the door. Come in. I got a real soft voice. I go in. I said, Carly, it's, we didn't meet earlier. My name's Rich Engler. Welcome to Pittsburgh and blah, blah, blah. I said, I know you're, they, they say you're having some problems. And I said, can you please try to get through the next show? And she goes, well, no, I just can't. I, she said, I barely made it through that one. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not feeling well, and I'm, I just don't feel, feel right in front of the, the audiences, and please, and I said, please, I'll, please, please play, and all of a sudden she goes, ah, and breaks out into a screaming, crying, uh, I don't know, I don't know quite a fit, but whatever, and I, at that point I knew 
it's, it, it's over. I said, all right, all right, relax, relax, sit down. I understand. It, you don't have to play. So I, I, I leave, I'm sorry, and bolt out, and I tell them the security. I said, fortunately, it wasn't a Motley Crue or an Ozzy Osbourne show. But, so I tell my people, go out, tell the people, unfortunately, Carly's not feeling well tonight. There'll be no second show. Hang on to your tickets. We'll let you know if it's going to be rescheduled or there will be refunds will be made. So it ended up, I called the agent the next day, tell him the story, and he said, well, I'll, I'll go back and... Uh, and check with uh, Carly's people and find out what she wants to do, and it, it was there was no more. Uh, it's it was years before. Now I think she does play a little bit again for uh, certain audiences. I know she can play in studio, like it's for studio audiences where there's a few, a few people, but uh, I think she she's coming around that, that maybe she can play again and hopefully I'd love to do the show again. Yeah, what a great voice. Yeah, so, so she made good, she made good, I paid all the expenses for the second show and they were very stand-up people and speaking great of, talent. Speaking of uh, security, um, obviously that's important and you speak to Motley Crue or some of those crowds. Um, any interesting security stories that you, you can think of? Well, one that really sticks out in my mind Again, this is a, one of my favorites in the book, that uh, it was a double whammy. Uh, I had, uh, we had George Carlin at the Icy Light Amphitheater, that sold out, completely sold out, and Ozzy Osbourne at the York Fairgrounds in York, PA. And I figured, I better tend to Ozzy. It's not that it, not, he was that wild back well, he was a little bit wild, but he was. The shows were always consistent. Sharon, Sharon was the manager, and, and very easy and easy to get along with. Great person, and so I get to Allentown, and uh, show was for seven o'clock, and I get there about six o'clock, and everything's fine. I talk to Ozzy for a couple minutes. He's in good spirits. Everybody's good. Opening act was ready. All everything fine. And the road manager from Ozzy comes to me and he goes, Rich, when that when's your security going to be in place? We're going to open the doors real soon. And I go, well, when, you mean they're not there? So and I, I look and I go, I don't know. Let me check on it. So I go to see my production manager from Pittsburgh. And he was out there covering, doing, doing everything. And I said, uh, hey, help me out here. Where's the security? I said, they should be in place by now. And he turns pure white and wants to pass out. And I go, well, wait, talk to me. Tell me what's the deal. He goes, I forgot to book the security. So my... This is an in, Aussie crowd. Aussie crowd. <laughs> so in my mind, it's not a problem. I just need a solution fast. So I'm thinking, hmm. So I go back to the road manager and... I tell him their bus broke down, but they will be here before showtime, before the doors open. So uh, that bought me like 10 minutes of brain power. So I'm thinking, thinking, thinking. So I go, I, I, I think this might work. So there's always a bunch of freeloaders, drifters, or whatever that doesn't have tickets. <laughs> waiting outside of the building. The freeloaders. Trying to sneak in, <laughs> break in, or if somebody give them a ticket or whatever. So I see a, a, several of them over there, and I go, who doesn't have tickets and who wants to see the show? All these hands shoot up. I go, okay, follow me. I need 20. One, the first 20 over here. One, two, three. They're kind of on So they, I go, go over there by the, about... 50 feet away, because I didn't want anybody to hear what was going to go on. So I get them away from the front of the box office. Okay, you other people have to go back over by the box office. So I take them over there, stand over by the building. I said, okay, here's the deal. We need you to be security guards tonight. I said, I, I'm going to swear you in as security guards. And they'll raise your right hand. They all raise their right hand and say, repeat after me. I promise never to say anything that I was just put on tonight to be the security guard for Ozzy Osbourne. If I'm at, asked, I will say that this, I, was, I was here and ready to go and ready to perform my duty. 
and, and, and you then gave I, him the oath. I gave him the oath, and then I said, okay, here's the deal. Everybody, everybody that has writing on their shirt, turn it inside out. I'm going to give you backstage passes and put them right here. It'll say security on them, and I wrote, write, wrote security on them. They all, all uh, put them on, and I said, okay, I'm going to march you in and put you in your places, and remember, you're really security, so you're, you're, it's Aussie, you're protecting Aussie, you're protecting the crowd, and I'm going to tell each one of you what your job is as I put you in place. So I march them in like... All guys? The, the roots. No, there were women too. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I was, uh, hey, they, 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 were, they were good too, because some places like around the mixing console, you didn't really need much security. Just people to say, yeah, move back yeah. and whatever. Yeah. So, there were never any. The biggest guys were right in front of the stage by the pit, where you know, always some knucklehead wants to crawl on the stage. Yeah. So, yeah. so you, so I march them in like, like, <clears throat> peeps following me in there. So we get, I get them all in their places, all ready to go. We open the door. Production manager comes out. He goes, "That's all I needed to see." <laughs> the thumbs up. I go, "Yeah, baby." So we're all set. Show played. The next thing I get is a phone call from Pittsburgh, George Carlin, man, he goes, Rich, now th there's a lot of bad language in this thing, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to use it on this, on this TV show. But he goes, why are, why are you not here, you bleepity bleep, 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 bleep. George Carlin saying. Manager. Oh, it's man a manager. Manager, okay. yeah. You mean, oh, what you're saying is Ozzy's way more important than George <laughs> Carlin, huh? I said, no, 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 Jerry. No, not the case. He goes, and what the show is sold out, right here in uh, Pittsburgh. I said, yeah. He goes, well, why is your guys, why is your guy selling carnival tickets out front for ec extra uh, tickets? I said, Jerry, it's a long story. They were obstructed view tickets, and you're going to still get your percentage from all these tickets. We just don't have any more tickets. Rather than let those people loiter out there, we'll sell extra people because we can, we can get them in there, but we have no other tickets. We'll show you the first ticket. And he goes, I, I don't like any of it. You pay me $3,000 extra dollars right now or we're not going on stage. I said, okay, okay. And he goes, bah, 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 bah. you dirty. Bah, 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 bah. <laughs> he, well, that's his way of saying he loved me because oh, because yeah. we were we have been friends for years. Absolutely. So he goes, all right, I'm going to put George on you, dirty da 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 da, da. hangs up. <laughs> so, so George did play, and the the evening was a success, and I was glad to, the next day came and I find think, us something new. I think any thinking man would go to ten to Aussie though. I think anyone that's using their brains would tend to Aussie over George Carlin. Well, I, that, that, you're exactly right. Plus, Aussie show was about ten or 12,000 people, where the George Carlin show was a pretty calm audience. They were going to laugh at jokes and probably drink a few beers or whatever, but yeah. nothing. we're not going to have any problems. Did you ever sneak into concerts when you were a kid? I, I had a better idea. What I did was... Uh, I didn't like sneaking in, but I had, and you're the first person to ever ask this question, by the way, that's a great question. I had a unique plan whenever I wanted to go see a show. Remember, I was a drummer. So, and what do drums come in most of the time? Drum cases. Yes. Okay. So what I would do, that wasn't only the drum case, that was my seat. So I would go to the backstage door of any concert that I would want to go to and knock on the door and I said, I'm here. And they go, well, who are you? I said, it doesn't matter who I am, it's what I have. It's, look, and I'd open it up and I'd bring out these drums and I'd put them back in the case and I'd say, the show can't go on, they're waiting for these drums. And they go, really? They go, yeah. I go, make any call to, yeah, I have the drums. They go, all right, if you have to, just go right backstage right now, okay? I said, okay, I will. So rather than go backstage, I'd go over by the mixer and I'd buy the mixing console and I'd tell the guy, hey, I have these drums in case somebody, in case they need them. And he's like, all right. I said, well, I'm just going to sit on the case here in case they, if they need the drums, you let me know, okay? None of that would have ever happened. So I sit there the whole night and any security guy, I said, hey, I have the drums for the show and that was it. Well, I had so, the best seat in the house. So how many times did you do that and what were some of the concerts you can remember doing that at? Uh, boy. I can't remember the shows, but I th probably did it six or seven times. Six or seven times. Yeah. 
Oh, I can remember some shows. Well, I lived, I grew up in Penn Hills, and the Holiday House was in Monroe. Oh, yeah. And they had some great acts there. Oh, did you ever work with that? I did not. I did not, but it was great. My band played there a couple times. Grains of Sand? Yes. Yeah, did you? a couple times. Did I, you? I, yeah, for... For, we opened for a couple bands out there. Well, I, I was I was at Penn Hills High School, and we used to have parties in the Holiday House rooms. We would rent a room and have a party for a bunch of Penn Hills High School students. Well, I would meander down into the lobby area, and I would see that all these people were going into this performance hall, and I didn't know what was going on. Well, the lady at the front door, she would get up and just leave every once in a while, and I'd sit there and think, oh, my gosh. I mean, you could walk right in there. So I... I, my father was a Pittsburgh policeman, so you know I, I, I was a, a law-abiding young boy. I didn't get in trouble, but the more I saw, she left again and came back, and I thought, if she does this one more time, I'm walking right in there. She walks out, I walk in, here comes the group, and it's Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons. And I'm thinking, oh, yeah. oh my goodness. Woo. So I told my friends about this. Two weeks later, we go up there. I say, let's do it again. Nobody joined me. I walk in. <laughs> the same thing happened. Walked in, blood, sweat, and tears. And I, some great shows. And finally, I got my friends to come a couple weeks later, and I got six of them to roll in with me, and we saw The Temptations. So that was just uh, my sneak in. But funny that I just... Uh, uh, it's funny that I just want to mention this, though, because I went to see the Jersey Boys on Broadway, and it brought oh, me back yeah. to that time when I saw Frankie Valli. But, you know, I want to talk about your book. I want to talk about how you can get your book and where can you order your book. Well, uh, here it is. Uh, it's 8 and a half by 11. I didn't want a normal paperback book with a couple cheesy pictures. It has 300-plus photographs in there in the, in the book that... Um, ex and it's a great book. Chris. Thank you very much. It has great Springsteen stories and and Clapton and this uh, Aerosmith. Uh, some of these photographs are 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 huge. And like if you're a Aerosmith fan, you can actually cut that out, and it's suitable for framing. And uh, Dave Matthews and there's a Kiss stuff. Um, Eighty. 80 chapters, which I call tracks because I tr kind of like made it like a, a record or a CD. And uh, it's for sale at so Select National Record Marts. Uh, uh, or, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's the old, oh, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's the old There's time no coming out of National in Record Mart anymore. Uh, no, right. Uh, select Giant That's Eagle okay. Stars. I understand. <laughs> I remember the National Record Mart. I've done that before. Oh, I yeah. made that mistake before. Select Giant Eagle. <laughs> so select Giant Eagle. Select Crazy Mocha Coffee Shops and Pittsburgh Guitars on the South Side. And, the, and if you get frustrated and can't buy it and it's sold out in any of those spots, at www.richangler.com, uh, the orders will be filled. They'll go out the next day, and most of the time you can get it in two days. So uh, that's it, and forget about National Record Mart. Giant, <laughs> Giant Eagle, Eagle Store. Giant select, Eagle. But, select Giant Eagle Store. But stores. you also have a website. I do. It's also www.richangler.com. A lot of other pictures that you can't even see in the book because uh, I wanted, I didn't want it to be redundant from the, from the website to the book. So some things that you can see on the website you can't see in the book, and vice versa. Can anybody get a signed copy? Yes, on the website. If they every every order that comes through on the website, I, I sign. Or if they make note, make it out to Joe or Mary or whatever. I I oh, will. That's great. And I'll put a, a keep on rocking or long live oh, rock great. and roll or rock and roll never sleeps. You know, you know, Rich. It, it just dawns on me that like many kids uh, grew up and go into a concert, you know, because there were a lot of kids back in the day that didn't have a lot of money, and this is why we were sneaking into things. And so when you got to go to a concert, it was a really big deal. It was a really big deal. Oh. So now you're putting these concerts on. Can you recall any time where you know the impact that it had on somebody that was maybe a notable type person that came to one of your concerts and ended up telling you about it? Oh, yeah, many, and, and many employees, uh, which I need to tell you about. Well, for me, sneaking in was I had a motive. I didn't only want to watch the show. I wanted to learn. I didn't want to be on that seat. I wanted to be on that seat and on that drum riser on that stage. That's what, That was my goal. 
but many uh, employees, interns over the years have gone on to greatness. Uh, uh, Joel Pearsman from, from Mount Lebanon area up, out here in the South Hills, Joel came to me and said, hey, I'd like to intern with you and be your intern and do whatever. And I had him, he was a guard, uh, guarded uh, James Taylor's dressing room one time and he moved up and moved up and he was, I could see he was a go-getter. He said, Rich, I want to go to New York. Will you get me a job in New York? And I said, yeah, I can get you in the mail room at one of the big agencies, William Morris or, or CAA or whatever, whatever. And I got him up there and he, he, he hit the ground running up there. And the next thing I know, he's calling me. He gets a great, great job and a great opportunity. He's selling me Genesis uh, uh, as an agent. And he went on, he, was, he went on to be the general manager at Madison Square Garden for many years which is like the ultimate you would think, but he did one better than that. He went on and he's the president and CEO of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame oh in New York goodness City. Goodness gracious, and he was an intern for you. Yes, that's where he started. Wow. And he, uh, he wrote one of the forewords in the book, which is it's kind of heartfelt, it's, it's great. Well, there's also a pretty big rock star that went to one of your concerts. <laughs> the first concert, yes, uh, uh, Bon Jovi. Uh, bon Jovi ended up in uh, over the years of, of the of playing his shows and and uh, becoming friends with Cindy and I. We were uh, fortunate enough to be invited to his uh, wedding reception with Dorothea and, and John in New York City on on a pier and had great fun. And after one of the shows, I think at Mellon Arena, at many years later, he goes, Rich, I need to tell you this story. He goes, My grandmother used to live in Erie, Pennsylvania. And on my summer vacation, I was up there 12, 13 years old. Your concert of the Doobie Brothers, Rush and Hart, was the first concert I ever attended in my life. And he said, I was so indoctrinated and so in love with what I was seeing and the, being a part of that audience, I knew that I didn't want to be there, I wanted to be up there. And he said, thanks for that, that inspiration. That's an unbelievable story. Yeah, that must have really hit you a little bit. Oh, because it really yeah. does make that makes yeah. impacts. These yeah. concerts can make impacts on people. Exactly, exactly. And and now that the book is out, people were coming out of the woodwork and telling me, "Hey, I used to work for you. You, uh, 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 man, Bill Allen, he owns uh, uh, radio stations and newspapers and." Uh, in Alaska and all these different places. He said, hey, I owe it all to you. You were the, my inspiration. Well, we're almost done. Uh, talk about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Pittsburgh. You're oh, the my first goodness. inductee, right? Yes, indeed. I, I, was, uh, I, was in, I was in shock. They called me and said, uh, Rich, you're going to be the first inductee in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for Pittsburgh and uh, well-deserving, and I said, oh man, I, I, I cried. It was, it was humbling, and in the same breath, it's beyond fantastic. It's gonna take place on January 23rd at the Hard Rock Cafe, and uh, the greatest part of the whole thing, all of the profits, every single cent goes to the Cancer Caring Center, uh, right in our area here, and you go to the Cancer Caring website, come on down, be a part of it, See, see, watch the induction and watch me probably cry and not be able to get through the speech. Wow, that, what, what a great honor. And you know, Rich, this, this hour just flew by. I had so much fun. I hope you had as much fun as I had. I really did. It was such a great time spending time with you. And truthfully, I have so much more to ask you. Maybe we can do it again sometime. Let's do it. We'll bring some new things, change the scenery and that works for me. That Make works it work. for me. That All works right. for me. So thanks again for being here. And keep on rocking out there. There you go. There you go. I want. I want. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. I, I, I really thank you for watching. Please join us for another edition of the Lee Adams Show. And I also ask you, please be an organ donor. Give the gift of life. Take care.